Disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed in this film are solely those of the authors and contributors. These views and opinions do not necessarily represent those of GCDD, a field with silos. Ben Oxley, McDonough, Georgia, speaks. He is in a wheelchair. People assist as he is fitted with a jumpsuit and carried to an airplane. I love the people from the South, just how humbling they are, how nice they are, how, you know, if you're having a bad day, somebody, like, hey, are you having a bad day? You can talk to me. Or, hey, you need to open that door? Yeah, they open the door, they help you, but... I feel like up north, they don't, they just don't have the same hospitality. They don't have the same, you know, loving on people. So that anyone that thinks the South is backward, they don't know the South that I know. I don't even know what South Korea is. You can't judge a man by that chair. Ben is secured to a skydiver. They jump from the plane. They smile in the wind on a sunny day with their arms open wide. You know, New York, people just don't just wave at you. It's like when you wave, waving at somebody and they're like, who are you, who, me, who are you waving at? Nick Papadopoulos, Royston, Georgia. He speaks from a wheelchair over a montage of city scenes, followed by rural Athens. Well, excuse me, good neighbor, you know. Rolling on the streets of New York, it's very treacherous, like you could have broken pieces of cement, like a ditch where they're, they're supposed to be asphalt, kind of like an Indiana Jones adventure going down the street. Whereas, like, I came down to Athens, the streets are like pristine, it's like driving on clouds. The, the sidewalks are wide. You bump into somebody and, and they're ready to hug you. And that blew my mind. I mean, I was like, this is my, this is my town, man. A town where I can, you know, hug a stranger. Georgia is such a close-knit community. They're helping the community and feeding the homeless and, and teaching people how to use technology. And that's when my, my advocacy came, came on and I got introduced to uh, centers for Independent Living. We guide the client so that they got connected with the people that they needed to make their lives easier. Kind of like a dream weaver, you know, weaving the dreams of, of people around. People performing administrative duties in an office. You wake up every morning and it was the best feeling. Your helping hand had made a lasting impact. Hanging up phone. I love it. Naomi Williams, Augusta, Georgia. She speaks over a montage of scenes showing her performing household chores. So God had a really bad sense of humor. Um, it was probably about six months before I got pregnant with Noah when I was sharing with a friend my fears. I had three. My fears were to be an old maid living with my mother, <laughs> um, to get fat, these were my fears, okay? And the third one was having a child with a disability. And it wasn't the fact of having the child with a disability, it's how society treats people that are different. A balloon reading baby boy, Naomi folds clothes. I've been blessed with really good people in my life. I have a friend she was due in July, and she had her baby in July. I wasn't due until the end of September, but Noah came in June. And so she jumped on this ride with me. <laughs> um, no questions asked. Naomi and friend look at photos of Noah. Naomi and Noah smile and snuggle on the floor. She sits and looks at a home on a laptop computer. She is working to build her house, her dream house, I guess. I remember one day she posted the drawing on social media. And I remember looking at the front and I said, well, what is this? I said, is that a ramp? 
She said, yeah, so no one can get in the house. The thought of including us into her dream home plans just blew me away. Because who does that? Title, 6,000 waiting. Exterior of a high-rise building. In downtown Atlanta on Peachtree Street, there's an office with a waiting list. There are 6,007 names on that list. Most of them have been waiting for years. This film explores the lives of three names from that list. Waiver applicant number 3,027, Nick Papadopoulos. I was a person living my life. I was going to concerts, I was going to the movies. I went to AFS, I was like huge. I had relationships, I would go on on dates and stuff. I mean, go out, meet somebody, share ideas, do something stupid, make a memory, go home, rinse and repeat, you know? I was a human being first and a person with a different ability later. But basically my whole life changed when I got that bed sore. An infected bed sore landed Nick in the hospital for three weeks. Unable to work, he fell behind on rent and was evicted. The hospital had said, you know, we can't put him on the streets. So this emissary from the, from the nursing home comes and people are shoving papers in my face to sign away what I think is my life and my finances and everything. And they're like, oh no, it's nothing, trust us. Every week, an average of 58 young Americans are forced into nursing homes. That's eight per day. Fifteen thousand of them are under thirty. When when the signing process is over, I'm like, I'm gonna get out of here tomorrow. Somebody's gonna hear about it and get me out, and I'm gonna be free. Three years later, Nick is bald, sitting with no smile. Underage residents make up 16 percent of the nursing home population in the U.S. They are the fastest growing population in nursing homes. Waiver applicant number 1734, Noah Williams. Naomi Williams, Noah's mother. When I first finished my undergraduate degree, I worked in rural Georgia, trying to lower the numbers of black babies that were dying. So I was working with women who didn't have access to care. Half of Georgia's 159 counties have no OBGYNs. And then also working to reduce the racial disparity in maternal mortality and infant mortality. Fast forward six months and um, found out I was pregnant in January. Going into the second trimester, um, I was starting to swell, my feet were swelling, and I realized my blood pressure was going up and I knew something was wrong. Went to the hospital, nurse comes in and says, oh, everything is fine, you're just being a paranoid first time mom. She closes her eyes and sighs. Black women in Georgia are 24 times more likely to die in childbirth than women in Spain and would be three times more likely to survive if they gave birth in Syria. Exam room eight. Naomi returned to the hospital, but the nurse sent her home and labeled her a hypochondriac for monitoring her own blood pressure. Tuesday was the last time I felt Noah move. And normally I would have called and been more proactive and had said something, but I didn't want to be chastised again, so I waited. I waited all day, actually. Naomi went to a different hospital the next day. 
I was there for less than 10 minutes before I was wheeled into an operating room. They were cutting my clothes off. They kind of pushed my mom to the corner. The last thing I hear is the physician and the anesthesiologist. The physician is saying, if you don't put her to sleep, we're gonna lose the baby. And the anesthesiologist saying, if we put her to sleep, I might lose her. That's the last thing I hear. Waiver recipient number 930, Ben Oxley. He has tattoos. He is in his wheelchair in the woods, loading a hunting rifle. He rides a tractor. I'm proud to be a Georgia Southern. I believe that Georgia way. And I'm a Bulldog fan to the end. I got a Georgia pride all through my blood. But when it comes to people with disabilities, let me just tell you, we can do a lot better. Archival footage. There was a time when society hid its mentally retarded. They've been locking us up since 1842. The majority come by court order. Milledgeville was the largest institution in the world. Electroshock therapy may be recommended for other disorders. Milledgeville Water Tower. Cedar Lane Cemetery. 25,000 people were buried here. Most of the graves were not even marked and the ones that were had serial numbers instead of names. It got so bad that even the federal government sued the state of Georgia just because our government would not close the institutions. Gracewood is even still open today. Since they can't legally stick us in institutions anymore, they've been sticking us in nursing homes or leaving us high and dry. It costs the state three times more to care for someone in a nursing home than to provide them with community-based care. But federal law requires states to pay for nursing homes, while community-based care is not financially guaranteed. That's where the waiting list comes in. 6,007 people are waiting on a waiver as we speak. The waiver is how to excuse yourself from the norm of institutionalization. Sorry, that's a big word. Let me give it to you straight. It would take my parents 12 hours to send me to a facility and the government would say, we gladly support that decision and we will send money to whatever human warehouse he's in. But say, I want something ridiculous, like a media clear American life. Drinking beer, hunting deer, and praising the Lord. Then the government would say, uh, sir, we can't support that decision right now. And then add me to the waiting list with 6,007 others. So what's this waiting list, you may ask yourself? It's 6,007 people wanting to live on their own daggum street, go to their own daggum church, and live their own daggum life as an American city. And by the way, my dad mows along naked. That's what I'm talking about. Free. Ben and his dad fist bump. The waiting list wasn't always this long. Georgia used to give out 1,500 waivers per year. And here's the story behind why. A graphic illustration with sound effects as Ben speaks. Now listen here. I want to tell y'all a story. There's a group called the Ark of the United States. And about 50 years ago, they had a big old concert down in New Orleans. They was eating some beignets, probably tearing up Bourbon Street, and talking about some jets. So at that conference, there were three or four mamas from Georgia. They got fired up, and they brought that fire all the way back to Georgia. And they said, we gonna take on that waiting list, and we gonna change this state for the better. Before we knew it, they don't round up a whole coalition of advocates. 
it wasn't just disability advocates. It was all the way from mental health to aging to physical disability. They all came together and they said, well, this is just horse We need to unlock that waiver. Now remember, this is pre-cell phone, pre-email, pre-all that technology. I mean, hell, the worst thing we saw is a cigar in the Oval Office. I did not have this whole mess of people, fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, citizens. They started calling, faxing, knocking on doors. They made so much noise from calling and everything else. The governor said, y'all gotta back off or y'all gonna shut down the phone lines. My, my, my secretary's about to have a heart attack. We gonna do something about that later. And they did do something about it. They passed a budget that released a thousand new waivers per year. And what does that mean? That means a thousand new people exercising their right to be in America. America! I'm just joking, but what it did do is give them the right to have somebody get them up in the morning for their job. Let's just think about it. A group of mamas went all the way to New Orleans to a conference, got ideas, brought the ideas all the way back to Georgia, and changed the state. What's the moral of that story? Never doubt a Southern mama, because she knows best. Quiet Street in Royston, Georgia. Nick Holt's family photos. My mom was forever the, the fighter. She was the vigilante for me, and she would spend hours when I was a baby in the hospital making sure that I got what I need. It was my birthday. When we had a barbecue, and she came out to see me, and you know, we reminisced about like, she, her, it was her dream for me to like to walk again, and she was always telling me, you know, like, Ah, Nico, casa de varas. You know, lose your weight, lose your weight. You know, you have to be responsible and, and be healthy. Don't give up, you know, just, just keep at it. I gave her a hug, and she went down to rest, and that, that was basically the last time I saw her. Nick's mom passed away from a hematoma. Nick cries. <laughs> Sorry. Shortly after, he was placed in the nursing home. <sighs> Naomi opens her eyes. I didn't know what was wrong. All I knew was my heart rate was beating way too fast. I saw a napkin on my tray table, and I remember asking my mom for a pen. And I wrote down my last will and testament. She is handed a photo of her baby, hooked up to machines. There came a point where Noah wasn't doing well. We all thought that this was Noah's last day. And I remember telling Noah um, while he was in his isolate, he was looking at me, and that was the most present he had been all week. And I remember telling him, I said, baby, if you want to go, if you want to go be with Jesus, it's okay. I don't want you to go, but if you're tired and you need to go, I'll let you go. That's not what mom wants, but if it's time, then you let me know, and I'll let you go. Photos of Naomi holding Noah. And he didn't have any more problems that whole night. So that next morning, um, I said, okay, we're gonna fight. From here on out, we're fighting. And that's what we've been doing. At one hospital, the physician had told me, he said, science says, based off of the trauma that Noah has sustained, all the things that he's able to do now, he's going to lose. Don't expect him to walk 
or to talk or to crawl or to run. He's gonna be mentally retarded. It's gonna be a very hard, hard road. But I held on to the promise that I told Noah that day that he was leaving us. As long as you're willing to fight and you're wanting to fight, I will fight. She rides a bike with Noah at her side. As long as I can walk and I can run, I will do that for you. She cares for him at home. Nick speaks. This would not have happened if my mom was alive. You know, my mom would have been like, we're gonna, we're gonna tie him to the trunk and get him out. We're gonna break my son out because I am not gonna let him live like this. I can't describe the love and the joy that I get from raising my son. He's a train wreck on paper, but that paper doesn't define you. It doesn't mean you have to limit yourself. It just sucks that it has to be so difficult to get out. All I think about every day is get out. How do I get out? Who do I have to talk to to get out? How many forms do I have to sign? Did I cross my T's? Did I dot my I's? Did I say what I have to say? Do I have to say it again? It's like a full-time job, and it shouldn't be that hard to, to want to be out in the community and, and live your life. Ben speaks. I can say to the legislators, please don't keep people in a box. Don't keep people out in the community. It's only hurting the way society looks at us. Nursing home activity room. Ben's family photos. Back in 2006, I had just graduated high school. To be honest with you, I went into a, to a deep depression. I woke up, there was nobody around, nothing going on. And you got all these things you want to do because your mind is telling you you can do it, but your body is saying, no, you can't. I can't cook without burning the house down. I can tell you how to do it, but I can't physically do it. Ben gently exercises. People think, oh, well, you're out of school, it's easy. Just call somebody. No, my friends were off to college. My friends were working. My friends were doing everything that I wanted to be doing that I wasn't capable of doing because I don't have a Medicaid waiver. So what do I do? I went into a deep depression. I questioned my existence. I'm like sitting at home with my mom, waiting for her to go to Walmart so I can get out of the house, waiting for her to have to go somewhere. What kid coming out of high school wants to go to Walmart or the grocery store with their mom every day? Ben's family photo. Naomi at home with family. You know, around the time Noah was um, three or four, I had learned about um, the waiver program. And so I went to put him on that. And I remember a staff member from the state saying, mm, well, he's so young and the list is so long, just wait until he's older. And I said, well, I understand what you're saying. However, I'm a single parent. If I have to quit my job to stay home and take care of him, then that means the state will be taking care of two people instead of one. That just doesn't make sense. A lot of times I'm asked, well, don't you have family members who can keep Noah instead of him being on the waiver. Again, I don't know anybody who wants to work for free. I don't know anybody who wants to clean up behind somebody for free. She organizes his medicine and equipment. 10 years ago, Georgia was funding 1,500 waivers per year. Now we're only funding 250 per year. It was Sometime in 2006, and I want to say it was in August. Ben's home phone plays a message. Hey, Ben, I'm calling from the Georgia Advocacy Office. I've got some good news for you. Give me a call back. Ben received the waiver. Wow. This is a new world to me. I can start focusing on my goals and things I want to do. It really taught me to start begin beginning to be my own person. What it's like in a nursing home, it's kind of like you've 
spent your whole life gaining this identity and in a blink of an eye you have somebody rip that away from you and saying, well, you're not going to be that anymore. You're going to be this. So if you're a, a doctor or a lawyer, an architect, you know, a teacher, that is stripped away from you. You are, you have become a resident. Since entering the nursing home, Nick has lost the ability to stand and do his own transfers. He is moved with a hoisted body sling. My one major fear is to die without an obscurity, to like without legacy, to be another speck in the wind, you know what I mean? Every human being wants to have something that they're remembered for and a, a mark that they want to leave on the world. And uh, if I don't have that, and, and if it's not remembered, then, then, you know, what the hell am I here for? Photos with friends. Laughter. I want the children of Georgia to never have to go through this. If a little kid with a different ability who hasn't had the opportunity to shine and become fully expressed. If I can start something and it, it helps them in some way, that's not even a that's not even a joy. It's like my it's like a duty for each and every one of us to make it happen for the kids, for the next generation. According to the CDC, 17% of Georgian children under the age of 17 have a developmental disability. That's 209,000 children. What's so funny? Video of Noah laughing. What's so funny? <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> You're so silly. Let me hear you laugh. I love it. Noah on a swing set. He looks up to the sky. Who is Noah? He plays with a bubble maker. His name means comfort. And he has been every bit of his name. Raising Noah is not the hard part. It's the systems that make it painful and excruciating. His life depends on people. He's not a medical record number. He's not his social security number. He's not an insurance number. He's a person and his life depends on people doing their job. She dresses Noah in his wheelchair. And people who don't push paper the right way can be a matter of life and death for him. She closes her eyes, shakes her head, and takes a deep breath. It would cost Georgian taxpayers an extra $49 a year to support all 6,007 individuals on the waiting list. Call your legislator and demand a plan to end the waiting list and join forces with the Georgia Council on Developmental Disabilities. Learn more at www.gcdd.org. Ben is working full-time at Mercedes-Benz Stadium, planning to start college in 2020. Noah received a waiver and has the support he needs. Nick still does not have a waiver and remains in the nursing home. His words of encouragement. Just keep at it. What else is there? You fight. You fight, you fight, you fight, and when you think you can't fight anymore, you pick up and you fight some more. <laughs> you swing until you can't swing, until your arm drops. And then you swing, you just keep swinging until you're free.